So very quick introduction to who I am, because I know most of you don't know me from Adam, so very quickly clear that up. That's Adam, and that's me. That's my 20-year-old son. Hiya, come on in. You haven't missed anything. I'm only talking about me, which is the least important bit. Um, so yes, yeah, so Adam's my 20-year-old autistic son um, and has sensory issues and lots of other issues. Um, and in the middle there, obviously, the other really, really important person in our family is Mbar Kingdom Brunel. He's a, a massive train fan, so when I'm not doing this, I'm somewhere on a railway. I'm a director of the Seven Valley Railway. I'm a director of the Narrow Gauge Railway Society, but I don't actually know very much about trains. It's a weird place to be. Hiya, come on in, sit down, make yourselves comfortable. So just very, very quickly, um, I've been working in schools since November 2000. Before that, I was working in industry, um, doing, doing IT. I work directly with mats and schools on a range of issues. Come on in, take, take your seat. You haven't missed anything important yet, you're okay. Um, so I work directly with schools and mats, basically the things they don't have the, the skills in-house to do. I get airdropped in to help and I help schools up and down the country, um, mostly from home these days. Um, I also work with various local authorities to help them provide solutions to, to schools across local authorities. Um, so for example in Sandwell, if there's anybody from Sandwell schools, there's a new safeguarding system in use there which I've put together for them. I'm CEO of the Worcestershire Governors Network. I've been a governor for most of the 20 years I've worked in schools. Um, I'm chair of the Sandwell School Business Management Network um, and also a committee member of the Birmingham Association School Business Manager, which is very strong here in Birmingham. Come on in, take a seat. You've not missed the important stuff yet, you're okay. Um, so I'm, I'm a committee member of the Birmingham Association School Business Managers, work with a lot of other school business management networks up and down the country. I actually provide them with a platform that they use to communicate, so I get to spy on all the conversations they have and understand exactly what's happening, which is where some of this information's come from. Um, and that network has about 5,000 schools, 10,000 people in it. Okay. Also, briefly going to talk about the Association of Network Managers and Education. Any techies in the room, if you're not a member, you need to be. We've got a couple of ambassadors in the room as well with us today from the association. Completely free. Have meetings like this that you can come along to, sponsored by Google, sponsored by Microsoft, at, at Microsoft headquarters quite often in Google's places, <coughs> and just free information for you. If you're not a techie, but you've got techies in your school and they're not a member, get them to be a member, because it's not about the technical side, it's about the professional side. It's about being more professional in what we do and the CPD side of it, although we obviously talk a lot of techie stuff as well. Um, Word of caution, um, I put this in all my presentations. I'm an IT person, I'm talking about IT. You've all already sat through a couple of hours of presentation. We're not known for our, our ability to hold the attention of our room and for our charisma, so bear with me, I'll try and make it as interesting as I can. We're also going very quickly because we haven't got a lot of time. This is normally sort of an hour of presentation. We're trying to squeeze into about a quarter of that time. So I'll go on, on a couple of tangents just to try and keep it interesting for you. Some headline figures, these are actually quite old now, these from 2019, I'm not gonna go through them. You can see, you'll have seen these before, I'm sure. Basically what this is trying to get you to do is realize that cybersecurity is really important um, and it's not going away and we need to take it seriously. But the fact you're here already says that you are taking it seriously. So congratulations, well done on that and we'll see how we can help you. <coughs> so schools know about security. We've known for a very long time and we know exactly what it looks like. We're used to this kind of thing we have to secure against the crowbar. It's been around a very long time. It was mentioned in, in Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet. That's how long we've had the crowbars to deal with. And as schools, we've got very good at dealing with that over the years. We know exactly what to do. And we don't really have to have, you know, symposiums and, and uh, workshops about security. We know what we're doing. It's not a problem. We're comfortable with that. But then we've got this new age where we've got cyber criminals, hackers, people out there, and we pretty much know nothing. It's completely new to all of us. We're learning very, very quickly, but you know, it's, it's a much bigger problem. It's come out of the blue, really, out of nowhere. So we've suddenly got all this challenge to meet with. And we don't know what it looks like. We don't know who it is, we don't know where they are. And more importantly, it's very difficult to know what to do to defend ourselves, because we haven't got the experience. So we're gonna go through some of those things in, in this presentation. So just again, just to reiterate how important it is, what's the worst that can happen? First one is significant disruption to your school. I've got a couple of examples here where schools had to close because of a cybersecurity incident. There's then the threat of confidential data being stolen and, and shared. Um, you can lose work, kids' work, coursework, which is obviously really important and can unsettle their whole future. PR is a big thing these, schools, this, this, these days for schools. It can be bad PR for you. Uh, you can also lose money and cost you money, which is never good. Um, so those are the worst things that can happen. This is, again, just reiterating why you've got to take it seriously. 
I'm just going to talk quickly about Cyber Essentials. The second presentation I'm doing this morning, um, it, it goes into a bit more detail about Cyber Essentials, but essentially almost everything I'm talking about here is covered in Cyber Essentials. So if you look at that, you're clogging about 99% of the holes that might be there in your cybersecurity. So it's really worth a look at, even if you don't go through the full process, it's really worth knowing about it. I'm going to go into more detail in the second presentation about that. I'm not going to go through the basics. You know about strong passwords. You know about how making sure your software up to date. We all know that. So I'm not going to tell you that again. You all know that. I'm just going to jump straight forward to some actual scenarios of where things happened in schools so that you can, you can understand what happened and understand why the advice is, is how it is. So um, this one with, with tagline, don't give it away. And I'm going to link each one to a film just because it keeps it interesting. And I've got some interesting facts about each film. So this particular one, if you look at this scene, I presume most people here know the film if they haven't seen it. But what you might not know in this particular scene, if you have a look at it, every single person apart from the three main actors is an identical twin. And they're all in there dressed identically, some more obvious, but they're all spread out. If you have a look at that particular scene and have a look, every single person in it is an identical twin. They spent a lot of time trying to go out and find actors and people who are identical twins, just to try and cover that attention to detail. So this example I'm going to talk about is about a particular multi-academy trust. This is one in Birmingham. So I got involved after it happened to try and help work out what had gone wrong and fix it. So the first thing that happened was a phishing email came in. The financial controller clicked the link, tried to log into the Microsoft box that came up. Obviously, it wasn't a genuine one. So that straight away, their email and password was then captured by somebody. OK. What happened next? The hacker then logged into that account. They didn't need admin account. They just logged into that account. They didn't need any more access than that. And they set up some rules to intercept emails, specific emails from specific email addresses, and forward them to them. They also then deleted them so that the Mac didn't know that the email had come in and gone missing. And they only compromised a couple of accounts because they didn't want to draw too much attention to it. So it wasn't a whole sort of whole scale, big, scary thing that happened. They didn't notice for quite some time. I'm talking a few months they didn't notice this was going on. So emails were being intercepted, a bit like if you stand in front of somebody's house and the postman comes, you take the letter off the postman and you walk away with it. That's basically what they were doing. It's that kind of, kind of idea. So what happened? The one particular email that they decided to intercept, the, the cyber, cyber, security, uh, cyber attackers, they took the payroll invoice, which is probably the invoice, biggest invoice that the MAT was going to pay throughout the year. So they intercepted that, and they changed the bank details on that invoice. OK, so it was a PDF. They just overwrite it with, with new bank details with their, their account they wanted the money to pay it into. They also sent an email claiming to be from Birmingham City Council, signed by the CEO of, of Birmingham City Council, saying, we need to change our bank account in a hurry. If you pay into this bank account instead, we'll give you a discount. Now, there's two things that have gone wrong here. First is the phishing email. Somebody clicked a link, which you know we've all done it, but you realize very quickly. The second one is thinking that the council is going to give you a discount on the money you're paying to your staff is a bit weird. So that was a massive failure. And this is the financial director of the trust that did this. This is not someone with that expertise. So that was a big, big problem with that. And that caused um, um, them to pay £400,000, because they did it for two months, two months worth of payroll, into a completely anonymous bank account. Um, they've never seen it since. And they still had to pay the bill of £400,000. So there's lots of mistakes in there that you can see. But that's the kind of thing that can happen if someone clicks on a phishing link. And it's not about clicking on the phishing link. It's a thing that things that happen next that you have to get right to stop it being a big problem. OK? So that's a, a real world example. So what are the preventative steps for that? Sack the financial director, I think, is the first thing you would probably do, because that was really not them doing their job particularly well. But this is why I always say verify if you're changing someone's payment details. And now when you go into a bank and you try and pay somebody, they make you put in the name of the person you're paying. And all those double checks are in place. That's why, to stop that kind of thing happening too much. Um, the things you can put in place, the policies or the procedures or the technical safeguards you can put in place, that's where two-factor authentication would have helped because they wouldn't have given away their login details in the first place or they'd have given them away, but somebody wouldn't have been able to then, then use them. Although we're obviously seeing exploits to that now, but let's gloss over that for the time being. Also restricting access in your accounts package. Some account package let you do this so that only certain people can change bank details for your payees. And always make sure you get the you know, confirmation that the bank has changed that you're talking to somebody and not an, a, a phone number and email. We, we know this, but that's the reason why. That's nearly half a million pound loss because of bad procedures, really, and bad policy. OK. And that doesn't need any money spent on it. There's nothing there that will cost you money to save you that money, is there? It's just about being smart and thinking about it. OK, scenario B. 
call this great with great power comes great responsibility. This is one for the techies in the room, really. Um, so one ring to rule them all. This is the bit of information that we've got about this. Tallest person in that cast? Anyone have a guess who's the tallest person? It was John Rhys Davis, who's six foot five. Smallest person on screen, and then Sean Bean was the shortest person in the cast. So that's what CGI can do for you. So this is one that, that will fill a lot of techies with, with nightmare, really. So this is, again, it was a phishing email. So this is starting from that same idea of phishing email, but the person that clicked on it was a techie in the school, was the admin. And they had admin access to the network. So when they clicked on it, it downloaded some software that didn't just in infect their drive and their access. Because they got access to everything, it infected absolutely everything, every user, in one go in about five minutes. But worse still, that admin worked for a trust who supported 23 other schools. And his admin access covered him for all those as well. So all 23 schools instantly got locked out. They weren't all part of the same mat. They were buying the service from the provider, from the, from the mat. They were selling their services out. That took um, not a few days to fix. There were schools that were without access to their computers for three months. People were having to bring their home laptops in and the home mobile phone to connect to the internet because they couldn't access anything for three months because one techie clicked on a, on a link. So this is why, and this is some of the headlines that relate to that and similar ones. It's all very, very similar. It's the same thing. This is why we say the preventive steps for this is that if you are an admin person, you don't have an email account on your admin account. Then you can't click a phishing link because there's no email coming into that account. You have a normal account that has no admin permissions that you use to receive email, okay? And then you can't do it. It's a pain in the backside, particularly if you've got 23 schools, because you have 23 access uh, admin accounts to go and log into each one. And it's an absolute pain in the backside, but that's why, okay? You've got to do that. So the preventive steps are still Make sure people don't click on phishing links. You're never going to eradicate it completely. People will always do it. They're always going to have a bad day. They're always going to click on that link. But under just make sure they know what to do if they do click on a link. What do they do about it? They don't keep it to themselves. You have to have a culture where people are comfortable in coming forward and telling you when they've done it. They're not going to hide it. So things like that. And then policy and procedures is making sure people only have the access you need and the access you need at that time. So it might be you have to have a couple of different accounts. And make sure IT teams have a separate admin account for each school if you can. Okay, from now on it is really considered very bad form if as a, an admin person you have one login and you use that for everything. And from moving forward, if you're still doing that, you need to start being ashamed of yourself because it's just too dangerous. It's, it's a pain in the backside, but you've got to start doing it just to protect everybody. Okay. Okay, and the next scenario is um, gone but not forgotten, Jurassic Park. Anybody know the plot of Jurassic Park? Know what happened, what caused it to go wrong? Sorry? It was the, it was this chap, the IT guy. He was upset, he was disgruntled, he was leaving. He wanted to steal the technology and take it with him. So he shut down the park so he could get off the island and escape. So it wasn't a moral story about, you know, whether we should be doing things with DNA, DNA and playing God. The moral of Jurassic Park is don't upset your IT staff. That's, that's what the whole film is about. Um, and this is a really good, this is my favorite fact about this film. So he goes through different guises throughout the film, different, different outfits he wears and they exactly mirror the Goonies and what the Goonies wore, because it was all Spielberg involved in it. For those of you old enough to know who the Goonies are, some of you probably don't. Um, how are we doing for time? Because I know we're very tight. Oh, we're doing all right, we've got about 10 minutes, that's okay. So this one is about the enemy within, I call this one. So this is again, policies and procedures. This is an exact, it's quite an unusual example. Lots of things here again had to go wrong, so this is, this is fairly uncommon, but it highlights <laughs> a very important message. So there was an IT technician working in the school. It, they realized that he'd lied about having a fraud uh, conviction when he applied. So he was instantly dismissed because they found out that he'd lied on his application form. They didn't shut down his admin account. So they've got a guy who they know is capable of fraud and lied to them, but they weren't worried about him being able to still log into the system after he'd gone and access everything. So that's exactly what he did and he logged in and because it was, it was during COVID, so we'd got lots of systems set up, he'd actually managed to not just delete data from the network, but from people's home computers because of the way everything works. So there were parents who'd got laptops with their work on that was being accessed by the school network and deleted, which, you know, 
unravel that? How do you deal with that? And how do you take responsibility for that? We've got a, a DPO in the room, at least one I know. I'd love to know their take on how we, how we un unravel that one as to whose fault that is. So, and that's all just because, and it was very casual to start with. He just deleted a couple of files. He was just being a bit mischievous. Then he realized he might get spotted. So he started to delete his tracks. And then he realized he had to do something to delete that tracks. And before you know it, he's deleted most of the network just to try and cover up what he was doing. Um, and again, that then meant that the school couldn't access the systems. And when he got out, what had happened and what was going on, obviously that's not great either. So very, very bad PR from that one. So the preventative <coughs> steps from that one, again, nothing we've talked about in preventative steps here so far have cost anybody any money, have they? Bit of time, bit of tightening up, bit of thinking. So in this one, there's not really any training you can give for that. It's all about your policies and procedures, your exit policy. Like you get keys back off of staff, you wouldn't let a staff member of staff walk out the door with a key to the front door. Why are you letting them walk out the door with the username and password to get back in? Okay, it's about making sure you, you have the procedures to know, to know what happens when people leave and that you follow them. Making sure you're logging things to check you know who's logging in. Somebody's gonna be looking at those accounts to have spotted that somebody was logging in that shouldn't be. If you're a SLT in school, what you can do is you can ask for confirmation to look at accounts that are active, that have been deleted, have a look at the list of current staff accounts and, and student accounts. A um, bit like you would with an asset register, you can treat a login like an asset register and look at it in the same way, make sure it's, it's shut down, that sort of thing. Um, but also, the other thing to think about is, I've still got access to the YouTube account and the Google Business account and several other accounts of schools I've worked at in the past. Nobody's ever wanted to take it off me and I don't want to shut it down because then the school will have no access to it at all. And I've been contacting the schools to say, really somebody should take over this Google business account because you know you want to make sure your, your hours are right and there's things you can do, it's very easy to do, and, and they're not interested. So I could shut a school tomorrow if I wanted to by posting on their, their school that, that they're no longer open. Um, so it's things like that you've got to make sure. So when people are setting up Twitter accounts and, and or X accounts as they are now and, and Facebook accounts, don't let them do it with their personal email address or their school email address. Use something like Twitter at or YouTube at or something because you can recover that that account then, you can assign that email address to somebody else, get it diverted to somebody else, and if you need to recover a password, you can do that. Whereas if it's a password that's been deleted or somebody's done it on their, their personal email address, you have no access. And you look at a lot of schools online, they've probably got three or four YouTube accounts accredited to them because somebody set it up in all good faith, then left, nobody's got access to it, the school sets up another one and another one and another one, it just happens again and again. So just get organized and think about it and look at the big picture. Um, so the other thing to do is, is about being prepared. So we know you're likely to suffer some sort of cyber incident, hopefully a minor one, but you're almost certainly gonna, gonna do something along that line. I've just seen a headline this morning, September is, is, has broken the records for the number of cyber attacks, um, not just in schools, but globally. Whether that's just because we're more aware and we're reporting them more, or whether there are more, I don't know, but it's certainly not going away. So it's really important to know if you're gonna get hit, how do you respond to it? Because all of these things, it wasn't necessarily about the first thing, the clicking the link, it's what you do next and how you deal with it. So um, how do you respond? So the first thing you do is you assess the damage. You look at how bad is this? Like you would if it was a, a fire in a school or, or some other damage, you look at it and you assess it and you go, right, how much threat is there to what's happening? What do we need to look at? And then you need to establish a chain of command. Somebody needs to be making decisions, somebody needs to know who is in charge. So if it's a ransomware attack, who's deciding whether you pay the ransomware or not? Who decides who's talking to the, the local newspaper about it? Who decides who's doing what? Somebody has to be put in charge. Doesn't matter who it is, but everyone's gotta know who that is, okay? And it might be you need to buy an expertise, you need to do all those sort of things, and that can all get slowed down if it's gotta to go to a committee and 10 people have gotta talk about it, and it's gotta go to governor approval, and the governors aren't around, because as a governor, we're not always available. Make sure that's clear and everybody knows. And make sure there are clear com communication paths. So. Who is going to communicate with the wider walk first? Who is the voice for you? Who's going to talk to the press? Um, and, and how are you going to handle all those different things? But more importantly, make sure everybody knows the plan. Because there's nothing worse than someone going rogue and being maverick and deciding to talk to the press and say some stupid things. Okay. Um, I was airdropped into a multi-academy trust that had significant issues, national headline type stuff. Um, and all the head teachers had to have press training because they're outside the gates every single day. And this is not a world we're in. We're getting better at it, but it's, it's worth knowing that at least one person makes a decision about who talks to, to people. Okay. Um, I suppose to determine these things up front if you can. I was talking to a school business manager yesterday who gave a really, really good uh, process that he uses. He uses the six-week plan. He says, right, 
I'm going to think about what's going to happen. So in six weeks time, I'm going to lose my work phone. I'm going to drop it in a car park. I'm going to drop it in a canal. It's going to be gone. Now knowing that's going to happen in six weeks and there's nothing I can do about it, what am I going to spend the next six weeks doing to make sure that it's not so bad? And likewise, I know in six weeks I'm going to have a member of staff leave. Six weeks I'm going to have a, 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 some click a phishing link. What am I going to do and what can I do now to make it as unimpactful as possible in that six weeks' time? Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So there's lots of tools on the NCSC website to help with this. They do a thing called um, uh, exercise in a box, which I'll talk about in a moment. But you will probably, in, in the worst case scenarios, end up using your business continuity plan or your, your disaster recovery plan, whatever you call it. So make sure that you've got that and you know what that is. There'll probably have to be a bit of steps you have to do to get into that business continuity plan. It won't be right from the start. You'll have to sort of find a way and route into it. You'll join it at some point along that plan. Um, but remember, you may not have access to all this stuff digitally. You may not have your phone system that you can talk to people. You may not have email addresses and phone numbers. So having something, whether it's a cloud backup, but if you've got a cloud backup, most cloud backups assume that you're going to bring it back onto the server that you've got. You might not be able to do that. So make sure you've got some way of accessing this data. With cloud-based MIS systems, it's a whole lot easier because you know that data's there. At least you've got staff and parent emails. But make sure you know you won't have digital copies in school that you can use possibly. Okay. And then the other thing that's important to remember, criminals are not nine to five. Criminals, quite often there's now a trend, they'll set these things off to, to happen at half three on a Friday night in a school because then they've got two days of getting at your stuff without you knowing. So if that happens, what are you going to do about it? Do you know what to do on a weekend if something happens? Do people know how to get hold of people and what the expectations are? Or are you just going to let them get on with it for 48 hours and worry about it on Monday morning? OK, because you'll find out about it somehow. Um, and then the other important there, there was, there was a very big tech company. They had a cyber attack, and everybody got locked in the building and locked out of the building. Nobody could get through any of the doors. So what do you do if that happens, if you can't get into the, into the building or something happens? OK. So this is your to-do list, really. First one is, is the training. That's the biggest thing you have to do is train staff. I was talking to a head a couple of weeks ago who said, oh, I've done the statutory training. I did five minutes in briefing on the 1st of September. So we're covered for the year. And that was literally her cybersecurity plan. That's not good enough. You've got to be doing this all the time. Reminders, sending stuff out, doing example phishing campaigns if you want to, if you want to go down that route. Have a look at Cyber Essentials. Again, I'm going to go into that in more detail, but that does cover most of what we talked about. If you're Cyber, cyber Essentials compliant, you're doing most of that already because it asks you to, to say that. And then preparing a response as an exercise in a box on the NCSC website, getting SLT together, governors together, key people together, just to walk through some of those examples. It's a really good way, a really good thing to do on an inset day or something like that. Get the key people together because it will make you think about it. It says things like, um, your school website has been hacked, what do you do? And then you have to, it takes you through the process of what you can do. And there's a right two weeks later, this has happened. And it's all a continuation. It makes you think about, puts you in that moment to think about what might happen. Um, so that's the presentation. I think we've got a couple of minutes for questions if anybody's got any questions. But I've also, we are going to be moving on to the second presentation. At this point, I just want to mention we've got, we've got the guys at the back there from HP who've got some good um, trading offers. That's the main thing I think you're here to talk about, isn't it? That you can get money for your old kit. I know lots of us have to pay to get money to, to get kit taken away, but um, there's some good examples up there. So does anybody have any questions on that just while I get the next presentation ready? Any comments, any thoughts? Have I said anything anybody particularly disagrees with? Because I'm always keen to hear that because I'm, you know, I want to make these, these, uh, this information as useful as I possibly can. No? Anybody happy? Yeah. Every type of culture there is. The heads in the sand culture to the over the board and doing way too much and completely over the top and you know, not workable for people. It's getting, better. it's getting better. Most people are in that really sensible middle ground. But what I worry about is the schools that are islands, the schools that aren't talking to other schools that don't know. That some schools aren't even aware that this is a, this is a problem. I say the head teacher who thought cybersecurity is just about a five minute briefing. You know, So that's what I worry about. But by you being here today, you're not in that category, so you're all good.